We started way back in Hebrews 5, thinking about what it is to press on to maturity and not have uh, dull or slow ears, but rather be quick to hear the word of the Lord. And uh, we are pressing on to maturity as we begin now to get into Hebrews chapter 11, the famous uh, chapter of faith. I want to focus on its first assertion, which is seeking a homeland. But first, I want to zoom out a little bit and look at the bigger picture here that Hebrews 11 is a part of. And the reason for that is I'm afraid that uh, I've taken too clinical an approach to Hebrews 11 and uh, definition of terms. Um, I think that's needed, and we probably will do that. But first, we need to understand what is being said. I mean, what, what is the reason for this? What's the rationale here? And the reason is that those who have faith are the ones who preserve their souls. That's the meaning of this. And that starts at Hebrews 10.35, and really that kind of closes around 12.3. These are the bookends on this idea that you preserve your soul by means of faith. Um, and that's really where we're going with this and the reason for the examples that are given and the reason for the uh, mention of the fact that they did not receive the things that were promised. They received a commendation by faith, but they didn't receive those things in their lifetimes. Hebrews 10, 35 and 36 is the, the first bookend don't throw away your confidence, which has a great reward, for you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. We have need of endurance. And really, this is that's all there is to this. I mean, the whole thing is saying this. <laughs> so if you're ever kind of lost in your thinking on some question in Hebrews 11, zoom back out to 10, 35, and 36. Don't throw away your confidence in the Lord. It does have a reward, but you need to have endurance and you need to do the will of God. And when it is done, you will receive the promise. Over in Hebrews 12, 1 and 2 is the other book end. Let us run with endurance the race set before us, looking to Jesus, founder and perfecter of the faith, who for the joy was, that was set before him endured the cross. So we need endurance to get to the end. We have to finish. This is the real meaning here. By faith, you preserve your soul, but by faith, why does it take faith? Well, that's what we need to get to. And inside of this, you know, 1035 to 123 kind of envelope structure about endurance, you have a few different points that are being made. First is that the, those who are living this way seek a homeland that is not this one. Uh, second is that God raises the dead. You know, third is that you have to leave the world behind. And fourth being that you, you conquer in the Lord. You overcome sin. You overcome in God. Uh, and then there's going to be applications made as well by Hebrews itself. But again, faith is the means by which it is to be done. And that's where the first bookend continues in Hebrews 10, 37. Yet a little while and the coming one will come and not delay, but my righteous one will live by faith. And if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But. We are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who have faith and preserve their souls. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. By faith, the people of old received their commendation. So it's the mechanism by which you get the commendation because it is the assurance of things hoped for, which means you're sure about the thing that you hope for. It's not a, a glimmer of hope. Uh, man, I don't know. I, I, I sure hope so. No, no. Your hope is your expectation. This is how it will be. 
and the conviction of things not seen, meaning you're, you're convinced that this is real. That's the reality of things. What God says, that is how it really is, no matter what it looks like on earth. But by this faith, the people of old received their commendation, says 11.2. But if you go down to the 39th verse, all these examples that we receive, though commended through faith, did not receive what was promised. Again, they didn't get it in their lifetime. This is about endurance. This whole chapter is about endurance through faith. You have to keep going even though you can't see it. <laughs> um, you know, that this life, uh, this life may be difficult and may present problems and challenges to us in the faith, but heaven is worth it and heaven is real. And serving God is the most important thing which you obtain by faith. All right, so that's the structure. That's the first thing, introduction. Now let's talk about the first assertion under this uh, umbrella, which is Hebrews 11 verses 3 through 16. They are seeking a homeland. Well, here are the cloud of witnesses in this particular case. Here we are presented with uh, these examples. Where you read by faith, they did something. Here, by faith, in verse 3, we understand. Uh, by faith, in verse 4, did Abel make his sacrificial offering that was accepted by God. By faith, in verse 5, was Enoch, the seventh from Adam, taken up. When God took him and he was not found. Uh, by faith, in verse 7, Noah constructed an ark. In verse, verses 8 and 9, by faith Abraham obeyed when he was called, and he went out, not knowing where. And also in the 11th verse, by faith Sarah conceived, which is different from by nature Sarah conceived. She did, in, in, in this case, bear the son of promise, the miraculous way that comes by faith. So these are the examples, the cloud of witnesses. And the assertion is that they are seeking it. Uh, they are seeking a homeland by faith. All right. So the first thing is the first conclusion underneath this, and there are three to support this point. The first is that God exists and that God rewards those who look for him. Not only is there a God, and it's good if you believe in God, but there's more. God rewards people, that's good too. But whom does he reward? He rewards those who seek him. If you are trying to please God, then you have that reward. And the uh, cloud of witnesses are, are in verses 3 to 5. The conclusion is from verse 6. So verse 3, by faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God so that what is seen was not made out of things that are seen. It's by faith the universe was created by the word of God. God said, this is what I did. Do you believe him or not? That's all this is saying. If you believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him, then you believe what he said. This is how it was done. It was created by the word of God and the things that we now see in uh, this physical realm were not made out of things that are visible. They were spoken into existence by his word. When he said so, it was so. This comes by faith. We trust him. We're sure of things expected or hoped for, we are um, convicted or convinced about things unseen. I accept that. There's no reason not to accept that God can do what he wants in this matter. 
In verse 4, by faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain did, through which he was commended as righteous, God commending him by accepting his gifts. And through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. And this, there's a whole, you know, there's a whole series of lessons to draw from this one verse. <laughs> but in our major point here, God exists and God rewards those that seek him. Both Abel and Cain sacrificed, but Cain was not accepted because Cain just brought an offering. Abel, for his part, brought of the firstlings of the flock, of the fat portions, which is the good part. That's by faith that Abel did that, meaning that he knew, sight unseen, that God had to have the best. And God accepted his offering. God did not accept Cain's offering. Uh, sometimes we are tempted to think that, you know, when we come to God and offer something, that he takes it graciously. That is not true. He wants what he asked for. There is such a thing as an acceptable sacrifice and there's such a thing as an unacceptable sacrifice. And Cain made one of those unacceptable ones. But if God accepts what you give, then you are commended through faith. And this Abel was murdered by his brother in a ritual human sacrifice. So through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. This one suffered terribly at the hands of his brother at the foundation of the world. And yet, because of that faith, he still speaks. And, you know, if you look back at the record of Genesis 4, we don't see what his words were. We just know that Cain, when he was angry with God, reproving him, went to Abel and told him about it. Implies that Abel responded to this in a way that did not make Cain happy very likely with something along the line of Cain, my brother. This is not right, what you are doing. See, that's not enough to kill somebody. Yes, it is. Have you ever read the gospel of Jesus Christ? He never did anything wrong. You can get killed for much less. But that's what Cain did. So this one still speaks through faith. When you believe that God exists and you believe that he rewards those who look for him, then you know that he has to be served and he has to be served well. He has to have the best, the first. What about this Enoch guy? Well, he's the seventh from Adam in Hebrews 11, 5. By faith, he was taken up so that he should not see death. This one did not see physical death. He was not found because God had taken him. Now, before he was taken... He was commended as having pleased God. Yeah, the record shows that he walked with God 300 years. He started to be faithful at age 65, and he walked with God 300 years. The testimony is that he was pleasing to God in his generation. This is by faith. He walked in a time when, you know, the Garden of Eden was no more. Abel was long gone. Just, you know, similar to you and me, just walking the earth with only creation, sun, moon, stars, and what there was of the Bible at that time. But he commended God, he pleased God, and because of this, he did not see death. He was taken up. This prefigures, of course, the ascension of Christ. But in the sixth verse, without faith, let's talk more about this. It's impossible to please him. You cannot please God without faith is the assertion here. If we are going to please him, you know, if we believe he exists and that he rewards those who seek him, then we can please him. That's what it's saying. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. Whoever would draw near to God has to believe. They have to have faith. They have to trust that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. This word faith, such a bad word, such a bad translation. It's trust. 
That's the word that we should be using for this. Everybody uses the word trust. You know what trust is and how it is given and how it is earned. And, you know, if somebody comes and tells you a thing and you trust that person, even if you haven't seen that thing, you believe that thing is what has happened, right? That's what it means to trust somebody. If a trusted manager comes to you or a trusted employee or a child whom you trust gives you a report and you believe it, that means you believe what has been said is how it really is. That's all that faith is. It's trust. Whom do you trust? In what do you trust? If you want to draw near to God, you have to trust that he does exist, number one, and that he rewards, number two, those who seek him, number three. Not only is he there, but also, yes, he does reward people, but he rewards those who seek him. Cain was not rewarded. Abel was rewarded. Enoch's generation, as a rule, was not rewarded. Enoch was rewarded. So you have to look. You have to make the effort. People have all kinds of thoughts about excuses for not doing the will of God or, or not knowing the will of God. And yet you see Enoch walking with him 300 years in a time before Moses, a time before Abraham. What could they have known about him? But he did. Abel, walking at the foundation of the world, knows that God has to have the best and even is daring to correct his brother who did wrong. So what's our excuse? <laughs> well, the next point here in this chapter is that they were looking forward in time. Not looking for comfort here, they were looking forward to the city built by God. No city here, but there. Hebrews 11, 7 through 9 is where our uh, cloud of witnesses are, the exhibits, if you will, in this argument. And the 10th verse is where this conclusion comes from. Verse 7, by faith Noah, being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen, in reverent fear constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By this he became an heir of, or I'm sorry, by this he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. Again, there's somebody working by faith. How is it? Well, he's warned by God concerning events as yet unseen. When you look back at the record, and again, there's so much to talk about here, we won't do that lesson. Um, but when you look back at the record, the earth was very different in those, in those days. It was watered from a mist that came up in the mornings. And there was something around the earth that was basically opaque water. There was a bunch of water somehow, whether that was liquid or whatever it was, we don't know but it had not rained. They weren't seeing rain. The earth was watered by mists. So for the Lord to say, the heavens will open, the earth will quake, and I will flood the earth. They'd never seen anything like it. They'd never seen rain, let alone the kind of rain that would flood the whole place. But God said so, and he trusted God. God said, this is what's going to happen. If you're Noah... Uh, you know, maybe you're thinking, oh, that's not possible. We've, nobody has ever seen such a thing happen. Well, that'd be a silly way to think, although it is the way most of us do, right? But God is right about this. And it is what happened. Because he had reverent fear, because he was concerned for God and what God said, and because he trusted the Lord above what he saw, he constructed that ark to save his house. And perhaps you would say, well, I thought it was for the animals. No, nah, I mean, the animals is, is a thing, but there's no question that if people wanted to be saved and wanted to get on the ark, God could make more animals. He'd have let the people go, but they didn't want to. When Noah had reverent fear and built an ark, he condemned the world which is what we just read about, um, uh, about Abel. When you are doing right, 
that makes others look bad, if you will. When you're doing right, others feel like that is a condemnation to them. Or perhaps you even say something about what is right. You perhaps even correct. That is okay to do in an appropriate spirit. But in so doing, the world is condemned. And he becomes an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. So he himself entered into this inheritance that is in God that comes through faith. He was just in the eyes of the judge of uh, the universe, God. That's the righteousness. And in verse 8, Abraham, by faith, obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. When God spoke to him in his father's homeland where he grew up, he said, you come out of this country and go to a faraway country. Because he trusted God, who said that this faraway country existed and that it would become his, he went. There's not another reason to be leaving your country, your countrymen, your family, your father's house, to go to a place where you know nobody. You have no possession. But he obeyed because God said so. And that he would receive an inheritance. So he went out not knowing where. And in the ninth verse, he went by faith to live in the land of promise as in a foreign land. Yeah, he dwelt there as a foreigner, living in tents, not permanent houses, with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. And it wasn't for poverty. This was not a homeless encampment. This was These men were very powerful in terms of their wealth and their possessions. But they didn't have permanent homes in this place they lived in tents why because they were into intense living no it's because uh, and that's a campy joke by the way um, but no it's because they wanted to assert something very plain which is the 10th verse he was looking forward to the city that has foundations whose designer and builder is God they're not going to lay a foundation in this land Right, that's the meaning of this. There's a better thing coming from God, and they know that. There is one more witness to hear from, who is Sarah. And she is the proof that they desire a heavenly country. In 1111, Sarah, by faith, received power to conceive, even when she was past the age since she considered him faithful, who had promised. She considered him trustworthy, is what it means. God said, come back, you know, when I come back at this time next year, you will have a son. And she did laugh. And God said, yes, this is going to be, you know, she said, oh, shall I know? Uh, you know, children, and, and he said, oh, yeah, you know, and if you remember this account, she's, she's like, oh, I, I didn't, I, I, me, I didn't laugh, you know, <laughs> and God says, oh, but yes, you did laugh, <laughs> you know, I heard you, but the time comes, and the child is here, and they name him Laughter. By faith, she trusted him, and because of this, she did conceive. Even being past age, it was a miracle. She was 90-something years old. But the reason why is that she considered him trustworthy who had made the promise. Because God promised that she would have a child and she trusts God, even though she doesn't know how, and it seems like it's impossible, God said so. Therefore, it must be so. He's trustworthy. And that's what it means. We trust him. Even if we don't understand or if we don't see everything, and we've got to be willing to be humble like this. The 16th verse says, they desire a better country, 
a heavenly one. What do we mean? Well, Sarah, you may recall in the account, is well past the childbearing age, and this is clearly the miraculous intervention of God. Abraham's about 100, Sarah's about 90, and they have this child laughter. Isaac, Isaac. Abraham already had another child, Ishmael, by the servant, Hagar. But that's a natural child in the natural ways. And he does become the father of the 12 princes of the East. And that's a great nation to this day. But it's not the same kind of thing as the child of promise. What they are waiting for is not an earthly country and an earthly kingdom and name for themselves. They desire a better country, a heavenly one. It's the spiritual descendants. Those who have the faith that Abraham had who are blessed. Now the conclusions that they draw in the text are these in the 12th through the 16th verse and then we will move on to the next one at the next opportunity. From one man, therefore, and him as good as dead, were born descendants as numerous as the stars of heaven, as many as the innumerable grains of sand by the seashore. These all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar, and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. For people who speak in this way make it clear they are seeking a homeland. If they'd been thinking of the land from which they had gone out, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country, that is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God because he has prepared for them a city. These are the conclusions from the accounts that we have read. One man, Abraham, him as good as dead in the sense that he's 100 and she's 90. But from this one were born descendants as many as the stars of heaven, innumerable as the grains of sand by the seashore. How is this possible? Well, it's not possible. God does things that are not possible. And that's how it happened because they trusted him. And yet, for all the good that they did, they died in faith, not having received the things promised. Now, Abraham didn't see all the grandchildren and the multitude that followed. For that matter, he didn't see the possession of the land. But he believed God. He did see his son, Isaac, No, they didn't receive these things, but they saw them and greeted them from afar. Meaning by faith, they understood that God said this and there, this is going to happen. Something is coming. This is real and actionable. Well, what's the action? Well, in their case, it was to do what God said, even if it seemed like it was contrary to fact. Because you trust God. He is always right. Our perception that it is impossible does not apply to God. Yes, they saw this, they greeted it from afar, and they acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. What does this mean? It means foreigners and resident aliens. So they have, you know, the earth is not our homeland, it's not our country, it's not our people, our culture, this world. Heaven is. And we dwell here, and we do the best we can to live peaceably with all, and to show honor where honor is due. You know, be good citizens, obedient to those that are in authority, giving thanks for the governing authority. We do all of these things, yes, but we are foreigners. And we are resident aliens, not citizens of the world. 
When you speak in this way, you make it clear you seek a homeland. You're looking for something. This isn't it. This isn't all there is. If it were, this would be very pitiable. And the other side of this is if they'd been thinking of that land from which they'd gone out, they would have had opportunity to return. It's true. If you want to turn your back on God, that's always available. If you want to go back to the world, to be friendly with the world, to be accepted in the world, you can. There, there will be an opportunity for such things. Satan will always provide that opportunity. But as it is, they desire a better country, a heavenly one. Do you have the endurance to wait for the heavenly one? That's the question. Do you trust God that you can make it to the end? God's not ashamed to be called theirs, for he's prepared for them a city. There is a reward for our effort. God is ready for us. Living this way and, and giving things up in this world, you know, sometimes is very painful, depending on what you're giving up. But God's not ashamed to be called our God because he has prepared the thing that we are waiting for, the thing that we are expecting, uh, the glory that he has told us about. It is ready. It is there. It's a real thing. And it is the true issue of life. So do you, I would ask, do you have the endurance that is necessary to preserve your soul to the end? And we'll pick up the next point at the next opportunity. Thank you for your kind attention. I hope these things are useful to you and uh, you can let me know if they are or if they aren't. Uh, we do have all the teachings available on the internet in various ways. We've got SoundCloud, we've got YouTube. Uh, there might be other things I don't remember. But it's all out there at South Austin Church of Christ org. Today, are you a child of God? Have you obeyed the gospel of Jesus? If you haven't obeyed the gospel in baptism for forgiveness of your sins, you haven't gotten onto the ark and it's about to flood. You haven't brought of your best and you're about to offer. You know, think about it. If we can help you to obey the gospel, we're, we're ready to do it. There's water here prepared that you might uh, be baptized in the name of Jesus, have his blood wash away every sin, that you might be saved from a devil's hell and inherit instead the blessings that come through faith. Are you a Christian, a child of God who hasn't lived right? Let us pray that you might be restored to him. If you need our prayers, if you need to be baptized, let that be known at this time, please, by coming to the front while we stand, while we sing. <laughs>